In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's a rhyme that I learned as a school child in the United States to remind us of the first time that the Old World, represented by Spain, contacted the New World around the Caribbean, South America, and Central America since 25,000 years ago when the lineages diverged. Now, this brought a lot of change of animals, trade, and diseases between the two worlds. And I will focus on what happened when the diseases were shared between the old world and the new, and what consequences that brought on. Why did the new world suffer so much more than the old world? This event has come to be known as the Columbian Exchange, named after Columbus. But the story of the disease transfer goes back tens of thousands of years with animal domestication. You can see from this graphic that most animals of significance, such as cow, pig, chicken, goat, or sheep, you know, the animals that you have probably eaten within the past week, were domesticated all within 10,000 years or more recent in Eurasia. In fact, almost all large domestic animals occurred in Eurasia or Africa, except for the llama or alpaca from South America and the turkey from North America. You might notice that the dog was domesticated some 20 or 30,000 years ago, and I will come back to why this is significant in just a moment, but as you can guess, it has to do with disease. There's another factor though, and that is global trade routes. And I wanted to show you what that looked like in the time just before Columbus went to the New World. Just from Arab and Chinese Mongolian trade, you can see that most parts of Africa and Asia were already interconnected by 1490 and by extension the European Peninsula as well. This is significant because they were trading animals and with the animals they were trading disease. This means that over 10,000 years or hundreds of generations the old world populations had the chance to develop disease resistance, while in the new world, even North America and South America did not exchange trade. So while the Aztec Empire and other associated peoples of North America had their turkey, they didn't actually get the chance to share that with the Incas and other empires of the South with their uh, camelid alpacas and llamas. This graphic shows how significant the time period is because animals were domesticated from 10,000 years ago and sooner, but the people separated about 25,000 years ago. This is this graphic here where Siberia meets Alaska. Now in those times, there was a glacial maximum. So the land was connected and the people could migrate into the new world. But once the ice melted, the land was separated again, meaning that these populations didn't have the chance to intermix after the Eurasians domesticated all of those animals. Perhaps the only animal that the Americans took with them was the dog. Why is this so significant? This is the main graphic that I want to go into. These are the major infectious diseases, roughly speaking, in order of danger to the Americans. Smallpox at the top and malaria after that. And as you go down the list, you can see that bubonic plague, measles, influenza, whooping cough, and chickenpox were transmitted from Eurasia to the Americas, while only syphilis is thought to have come from the New World to the Old World. Even that is not actually accepted by all uh, academics, and typhus 
may have gone from the new world to the old, but that is also a little bit unresolved. Even if syphilis and typhus went to Europe from America, they were not nearly as deadly as all of those listed above. And that raises the question, why such a major transmission from Eurasia to the Americas? Well, the easy answer would be that the livestock gave all of these diseases to the Eurasians and Africans over hundreds of generations, and they developed a resistance to these. That's just the easy story, because measles and influenza came from livestock, and as you can see, they emerged from 1,000 to 8,000 years ago, which is clearly after the Americans already separated from this Eurasian African lineage. But, um, so yeah, if measles did come from cattle and influenza came from waterfowl or swine, sure, that's an easy enough story. But those were not the worst diseases to kill the people in the New World. Smallpox, malaria, and bubonic plague were probably much more deadly than measles and influenza. And they didn't actually directly come from livestock. Well, let's start with the slightly easier explanation, which is... Humans evolved from Africa, so our closest relatives are the primates and African monkeys. So it's very possible that malaria, whooping cough, and chickenpox came from our near ancestors in Africa, who we co-evolved with and had a lot more chance to exchange disease with. But again, that's not the whole story because you can see that malaria and chickenpox perhaps developed in the time before the lineages separated. And with malaria, it, it's almost certainly the case that the population that moved to America were already exposed to malaria before the split. And the very worst disease, smallpox, is a little bit unclear. With You can see the emergence date of 4,000 to 68,000 years ago, being clearly within the range of the lineages still in contact with each other. So there has to be another explanation. And this probably goes back to the global trade routes shared between Eurasians and Africans, which I have to say was enabled by livestock. I haven't mentioned horses yet. While horses don't seem to transmit too much disease to humans, they did allow humans to travel. So horses were absolutely the main way to get around by land until just a hundred years ago. So because of the interconnected trade networks allowed by livestock and horses, smallpox, malaria, and other diseases that were on the fringes of human settlement and wildlife, such as wild rodents, wild mosquitoes, there was just so much more chance for infected humans to pass it to another human. These seem to be the reasons why the disease transmission was mostly from Eurasia to the Americas, where a sexually transmitted disease like syphilis may have gone to Europe, but even that one is not confirmed. And the sad and, you know, perhaps consequences that you already know are demonstrated in this graph. This is a study from mitochondrial DNA. So this is just in a female population of indigenous Americans. You, the the x-axis might be a little counterintuitive at first if you're not used to these. On the left side of the x-axis, that's the present day. And on the right side of the x-axis is 20,000 years ago. So let's read from right to left. And you can see that the population was stable for some 7,000 years until the Clovis culture appeared and there was a major spike in population of Native Americans that was sustained until European contact. 
It may not be completely clear from this graph, but the authors O'Fallon et al. state that their data says there's a 50% drop in population upon European contact, and other sources state as much as 95% drop in population after European contact. That is primarily from disease. Of course, there is also warfare and displacement, but disease was the main factor. And it has to do with generations of Eurasians and Africans becoming resistant to multiple exposures over vertical transmission, or that is generation to generation transmission, where the Native Americans were suddenly exposed to horizontal transmission and the immune systems just could not cope. A lot of what I have presented was laid out in the 1997 book by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which has some dated information by now, but it has the, the overall story has largely held up. And so here are some more uh, up-to-date references if you want to take a closer look.